woman crawled back to safety an NGO found her later and she's now been admitted to the hospital but one month later post that incident no arrests have taken place in the city we have Shrija joining us with more details on this case Shrija if you can take us through what exactly happened on that horrific night absolutely inhumane the kind of uh, things that came to light from that particular case this woman was gang raped uh, these brutes took turns to rape her and post that left her to fend for herself In fact, this is a very horrific incident coming from Bengaluru, from Arnikal is what we're given to understand, where this particular 26-year-old woman, she was left to fend for herself after she was gang raped by nearly six men who came on their bikes when she was sitting in a bus stop, Arnikal bus stop, where they accosted her. And one of them, in fact, flung her into uh, thin hair is what we're given to understand. And then they pushed her across this particular wall in a dilapidated building. And also, uh, after that, that point in time they just left her there to die her clothes were completely uh, torn and there was nothing no help was even being offered despite there were people around there were uh, passers-by who even noticed her but nobody even uh, walked up to her to even ask her what exactly the problem was but instead she crawled back to safety she went to a nearby she went to a dustbin she picked up a ragged cloth a shirt a torn shirt and she covered herself she covered her body with that particular shirt and then she came and sat in the bus stop is what we're given to understand and the first person to notice or rescue her is Parijata from uh, an NGO where she immediately she narrated her entire ordeal what happened to her where she's from and immediately Parijata rushed her to a hospital and at this point in time she's been taking a treatment at Boring Hospital at One Stop Crisis Center under the Nirbhaya scheme and also as far as her treatment and her condition is concerned we understand that she is recuperating but however she'll take at least uh, six to uh, six months to at least a year for her to completely come out of that kind of a uh, horrific incident and also she's right now being treated for depression antidepressants have also been provided to her counseling also has been given and she's slowly recuperating is what we're given to understand Also, uh, Shrija, take us through whether anybody has been questioned in this case. We understand no arrests have been made so far. Uh, what is the government's response? What does the Home Ministry uh, have to say uh, to all of this? Uh, they are already uh, in fact on the lookout for the culprits they have launched a band hunt because remember they are trying to uh, get uh, some sketchy details from this particular victim because remember the entire horrific incident the the kind of excruciating pain that she went through in that particular situation they're trying to get at least some sketchy details out of her but as far as the investigation is concerned we understand it's been a little more than three weeks and there has been no uh, clues at all as far as this particular case is concerned no breakthrough absolutely no breakthrough and there are no culprits at all and uh, as far as the police investigation is concerned they have registered two separate cases because one being the rape case on the all the six men and the second being because after that particular horrific incident she took shelter in that uh, same the very dilapidated building where uh, just a day after the owner of the building and uh, two three workers came and in fact evicted her from that building without even showing any compassion or even any concern uh, and just evicted her from that uh, particular location and for that a case has also been booked across uh, uh, against three people and all these three people have been arrested but as far as the rape is concerned we understand that the police still have no clue and uh, they're still groping in the dark as far as the culprits are concerned Well, all right, Shrija, many thanks for getting us those details there. Though, like uh, Shrija was pointing out, the victim is currently recuperating in a hospital. There has been no aid that was given to her when she was left to fend for herself. Later, an NGO picked her up and they uh, admitted her to a hospital. Currently, like Shrija was also pointing out, the police is clueless. Karnataka police, they're absolutely clueless. In the meantime, the victim narrates... Her ordeal.
हुआ था जब मैं आ रहे थे गम से आ रहे थे तो उधर गाय चढ़ाने वाले उधर बैठी हुई थी तो गाय चढ़ाने वाले मुझे बुलाया कि आकर नहीं इधर बैठ मुझसे बात करना करके बोल गया हाँ तो थोड़ा थोड़ा हम लोग पंद्रह मिनट बात किया पंद्रह मिनट बात करके वो चली गई चली गई जगह वो दो बाइक आया तो बाइक में आया तीन तीन लड़का लोग था हाँ तो तीन तीन लड़का लोग बोला कि मेरे को छुपे का काम मिलता है करके मैं बोला आंदन मिलेगा मुझे पता नहीं करके तो मुझे मेरा पेड़ पकड़ लिया हाथ पकड़ लिया मेरे को अंदर फेंक दिया अंदर अंदर फेंक दिया और मेरे दो लड़कों का मुँह बंद कर दिया मेरा मुँह बंद कर दिया और जाके मेरे कपड़ों को फाड़ दिया मेरे कपड़ों को फाड़ के मेरे को सर में मारा दो दो डूंगा से सर में मारा फिर स्टार्ट किया दो तीन लड़का लोग ऐसे किया तीन लड़कों लोग वीडियो बनाया तीन लड़कों लोग मेरे को किया तीन लड़का लोग वीडियो बना क्या क्या किया ऐसा किया ओके तीन लड़का लोग नहीं किया तीन लड़का लोग किया ऐसे किया फिर उन लोग बैठ के डाल पिया सिगरेट पिया उन लोग उधर ही बैठ के बैठ के जितना नौ बज गया नौ बज के वो लोग बोला कि टाइम हो गया टाइम हो गया मैं जा रहा हूँ करके इसलिए वो चला गया उन लोग चला गया तो बोला कि तू आकर मेरे को बाहर मिला तो तेरे को मैं मार डालूँगा ऐसे बोला था हम कि देखे गया है मेरे को मेरे को ऐसे ये था हम कि देखे गया है Well, here's the question we're asking on Pulse on Mirror now. Four years later, has anything changed on ground and fall? In fact, the NCRB data also suggests that the number of rape cases have only increased. Three, four, one, two cases in the city of Bengaluru alone. New Delhi and Mumbai. The numbers are staggering. In fact, uh, let me get in some voices here. Uh, uh, we have a couple of women and um, some uh, psychologists also joining us on the show. Uh, first, let me begin with you. Uh, you know, the kind of case that's come to light in Bengaluru right now where a woman was gang raped and left to fend for herself. This is not a one-off case that we've seen. How safe do you feel as a citizen? In Mumbai, I can feel I'm safe, but the other state, I, right now the Bengaluru case, it's realist humanity is not suitable. But definitely, as a human, as a woman, if you are going to respect to each other, this kind of case is not going to be happen. So we have to put our hand forward to help to each other and secure as a woman. Do you do you believe that uh, we're becoming a nation of onlookers in the sense that in this case we've seen that this woman was left to fend for herself for three days. Literally nobody came to her help. Uh, actually people should come forward and help her in spite of just looking the matter or something else. I think being a girl, if a girl is a victim of such incidents or something like that and if we see a crowd where people like search should come forward and help the per person who's a victim of that and at home uh, I mean if uh, I'm gonna come to you with this question at home if you could take us through how uh, difficult is it for you to send your children out I mean looking at the number of cases that are increasingly coming to light we've seen from the NCRB data that uh, in 2014, 15, and subsequently to 16, uh, the number of cases have only increased. That's true. And now, when we send anybody out for uh, out, we have to first make sure that what is the safety. I mean, has the school made proper plans to make sure that the children are going to be taken care of, or has the college taken uh, proper uh, uh, precautions? So definitely, it's a cause of concern. And who is the people who's going to be along with the child? So sending the child alone definitely is a cause of concern today. The question that we're asking right now is four years later, what has changed on ground? We know that in 2013, uh, uh, the rape laws were amended, but how much of that has been enforced? What is, what is the real challenge uh, uh, that we're facing at this point? So it's not so much that our laws or our systems are not in place. Of course, there's enforcement, but we're also dealing with the reality that is our population and it is out of control. We are limited in our resources also. I think what needs to change is the social apathy that we are facing as a nation. We as a people are required to do more than just wait for the law to get into motion and you know we need to take our rights in our hands and somewhere uphold and support each other like someone else was saying this woman was left to fend for herself that attitude towards the victims of these heinous crimes must change and the people must become more aware and more assertive of what needs to be done what is right or wrong and enforce the crime the the you know heinousness of these crimes among our people in our society at a grassroots level and then let the law 
take its course. Maybe set up something fast track to deal with such crimes by themselves so that there are speedier remedies for such victims and they're not just left with the due process. So do you believe then that uh, cases must be fast tracked? The implementation uh, is the real challenge here. We have the laws in place. Yes, in my opinion, it is very, very important for us to consider now to have a separate system established only to deal with heinous crimes such as this, whereas we ensure that just because of due process, the real justice that these victims deserve and the check that we need to put on such offenders is, is moved faster. So it, in yes. fact, a psychologist also joins us right now. Uh, uh, the other thing that is you know neglected most of the time is the kind of stress and depression that the victim will go into post that and getting back up from an incident like this is uh, is absolutely impossible see uh, even when we hear it okay like we're not the ones who are actually experiencing so even when we hear it gives us that kind of shiver and thrill in our body so we can imagine what actually would have happened physical wounds one side but the feeling of being helplessness that like completely shatters a person so it's it's going to be so challenging for her two parts one is the stigma of society that she had to go through this so you know facing the people back again being able to trust is going to be challenging and the main thing that she need to fight is the PTSD that's post-traumatic stress disorder it takes years and years to come out of this with a right kind of theory and approach and by and large the support from people whom who really care for you so it's I mean I'm not saying it's not possible but it's a long way to go by the time our physical wounds heal is when you know the mental wounds will start kicking in more and more the feeling you cannot forget these kind of incidents ever in your life so they're going to be these nightmares which are always going to be there and I understand that she's all by herself she lost her family in an earthquake so it's going to be further more challenging for her to find that support in someone where you know uh, there is a you know strong pillar for you so it's definitely going to be extremely challenging and I mean God God be with her and you know give her all the strength and support in fact uh, you know you're a neuropsychologist uh, uh, at this point in time if you can tell us uh, is there any impact on the brain as such over a, a long period of time definitely there is there's a huge impact so uh, like she mentioned post-traumatic stress disorder okay, uh, when a person goes through trauma there's a lot of things that happen to them uh, they are not able to concentrate she might keep getting flashbacks of the incident her memory might be affected maybe she'll just black out the entire episode or it will keep coming back to her even further on even when she recovers and uh, you know there, there she's she might have difficulty concentrating paying attention so there's huge impact on the brain and so what is your advice uh, for uh, for you know victims uh, who are first of all very extremely afraid to come out and report cases like this but how, to cope with it uh, post incidents like this See, the, uh, the best way and the most comforting way is getting into group therapies. The feeling that you are not alone itself plays a large role. The moment you know that there is somebody who is understanding, there is somebody who can, you know, who has also gone through this, it becomes easier to share because they are not going to be judged. So once they kind of get this kind of support, it makes it very easy for them to share and open up. Of course, it's going to take a while. It cannot happen overnight because they're not the first family. So luckily that NGO who's supporting, if they can introduce her to kind of group therapies and, you know, they can make a small circle for her. The workplace uh, should be also approached saying, I mean, it's, it's human. It could have happened to anyone, not just her. It could have happened to any other lady working over there. So they should also be very, very positively welcoming back because it's an incident you know it's no one's fault I mean it's definitely not her fault it's besides the victims it's not at all her fault so the more acceptance she gets the more trusting she can become again but it's a long process coping and dealing of course is one aspect of it post-traumatic stress like uh, uh, they were talking about but you're a lawyer if you can uh, you know quickly tell us we've seen in cases with influential people uh, cases have been fast-tracked in, in a case like this where this woman uh, works for a paltry sum of 50 rupees per day getting back up on her feet is a big big challenge uh, what amendments must take place now what do you think must be done 
Uh, at the outset, I think it would be wrong to say that only in the cases of influential people do matters move fast. Uh, we don't know how uh, the judiciary uh, functions by process, so it's not like it favors anyone. So as an officer of the law, that would be wrong to say. But as far as amendments are concerned, like I said, uh, for these cases where we know that waiting too long is going to do the victim more harm and justice is going to be delayed as good as denied in these situations, which is why we must amend our system to maybe establish a separate system altogether that deals with just these offenses specifically maybe like a fast track court but a special court like we have for POSCO now we should have a special court that deals with only such heinous rape cases where we know victims have been rescued and evidence is a challenge but we must have redressal in place to support her not just legally and not just ensure that the uh, that the police are doing their job fast that, that the state is prosecuting it well but also also ensure that other social and, and rehabilitation that these victims require to integrate, get their lives back together and get back to society must be put in place and more awareness will be spread this way. So at least the perpetrators know that they're not going to be left unchecked and it's not going to be six years or ten years before they, they get a fine or a sentence. We must come up with harsher punishment also in my opinion, especially for crimes like these. We must consider, if not the death penalty, chemical castration. In fact, uh, uh, you know, a quick question also uh, on the kind of laxity that we've seen from the police. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, unfair to say that the victim does not go and lodge a complaint. Uh, what is your view in that aspect of whether victims should go ahead and report the case? Because a large number of cases we've seen go unreported. Yes, ground reality is very, very different. It's easy for people to say that you must go and file a complaint, but the police are not always very wel welcoming. They're not very helpful. The victims themselves feel a lot of stigma when they're trying to go and report. So that attitude of apathy or of victimization, even at, at the police stations, must change. So they must be sensitized towards the entire process. And they must be more happy. Well, those changes have to come in place and perhaps a special court uh, uh, to address issues like this. In fact, uh, redressal mechanisms uh, and uh, dealing with post-traumatic stress, which almost nobody talks about, something that uh, you know the society needs to look into is the word coming in. We're going to, on Mirror Now, continue to track this case, of course, uh, and uh, continue to focus on uh, whether in this particular case any arrests will be made or not. Uh, with that, let's also quickly take a look at what else is making news today. In fact, uh, big relief coming in, uh, an update in the all crucial Aadhaar hearing. The Supreme Court has in fact concluded its hearing on Aadhaar, uh, whether, on whether it should be made mandatory to link Aadhaar with all services. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the Supreme Court uh, will begin hearing pleas on the validity of Aadhaar on the 11th of Jan. We have Meenakshi joining us with more details on that. Meenakshi, take us through what observations were made by the court. Uh, well, you know, this was a bench uh, that was pretty much absorbing all that was uh, being, uh, uh, you know, directed towards the bench by way of uh, uh, arguments from the petitioners. We have had a battery of lawyers, some very eminent counsels uh, from Arvind Datar, uh, Gopal Subramaniam, Prashant Bhushan, uh, uh, Anand Grover, and also Mr. Sham Devan, who have assailed Aadhaar on multiple uh, aspects uh, before the Supreme Court. They have highlighted as to how the common ban on the ground uh, from a HIV patient uh, to a child who's a student who has not attained the age of consent uh, is being asked for Aadhaar and as we speak in spite of the earlier orders of the Supreme Court which said that Aadhaar should be linked to about six uh, schemes uh, as things stand today Aadhaar is linked to 139 uh, schemes but the big news point from the Supreme Court is ahead of the orders from the Constitution bench which will go on to determine if any judicial orders are the need of the R uh, to stop uh, this uh, linking processes that are currently uh, underway while the uh, judicial examination of Aadhaar is still incomplete. The government has uh, relented, Amita. The government has shown willingness to extend the deadline to March 2018 uh, for all uh, uh, aspects of everyday life uh, except, except 
except uh, one uh, one uh, situation where the government is not willing to relent and that is the opening of the new bank accounts uh, where after opening of a new bank account you need to submit your aadhaar detail uh, six months from the date of opening so on that account the government uh, is not willing to relent but on all other aspects including linking of mobile phones with aadhaar the government has shown willingness to extend the deadline uh, to at least march 2018 for linking of mobile phones with aadhaar the government has today highlighted uh, that perhaps uh, it will need a judicial order to extend the deadline because the earlier order of the supreme court in the lokniti case is being complied with but the willingness from the government uh, for this conciliatory gesture to extend the window uh, to 3 more months till march 2018 uh, offers this opportunity and the window uh, for the supreme court to begin hearings uh, on the january uh, 19th on the final question of whether the aadhar act uh, really is constitutionally valid or not back to you All right, Meena. Actually, many thanks for getting us those details. In fact, we have Ritesh Bhatia joining us uh, now, cyber expert. If you can uh, take us through how big of a relief uh, this is, uh, the government showing their willingness to uh, extend the deadline, like Meena she was pointing out. But the crucial hearing, of course, is on the 11th of Jan onwards. Yeah, I mean, firstly, I don't understand why they are taking it till uh, stretching it till the 11th of Jan, and tomorrow at 10:30, I think they're going to give the wor uh, verdict also. Um, as far as the relief is concerned, I I genuinely don't see any relief for uh, the the users. I see the relief for the the telecom operators and the bankers. Uh, otherwise, I don't see any kind of relief. And uh, now, uh, you know, they have time and again pointed out about data privacy, data protection. So when the draft is in its place. why again the same question you know why again the tearing hurry as such but but a quick question uh, uh, it's a breather for people who uh, are wondering whether they want to link uh, aadhar with the bank accounts or mobile phone services even for now no but then uh, i want to know uh, how different was the conclusion uh, of supreme court today compared to what it was like yesterday i mean day before yesterday uh, so you look at the confusion that's happening day before yesterday that's on the 12th on the 12th the, uh, the you know in the notification they said ki okay you know till a particular period of time till the government notifies yesterday on the uh, press information uh, website they said no it is 31st march okay. so today where they have said it's it's still the 31st well, march well we're going to wait for that order of course at 10:30 am tomorrow but uh, some interim relief they coming in for people uh, and uh, the crucial hearing of course is going to start in january uh, where we will keep a very close watch on here on amira now that we wrap things up here on this bulletin stay with us